so much for being here. Can you hear me on the mic or? Can yeah, this one. Oh, that one, okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for having me this evening. I'm delighted to be with you. Um, I have lived in California and Washington and Nevada, but I have never been to Arizona. So this is my first time here and it's really beautiful. I'm, I'm really, it was just magnificent coming in on the airplane this morning. So thank you so much for the warm welcome and having me here. I'm so excited that I get to be with you this evening to share what our organization does, um, as Father mentioned, called Healing the Culture, where we try to help shed light and not heat on the life issues, such as abortion and euthanasia. And I know that in your own uh, state, abortion right now is a really hot button issue because of this constitutional amendment. And that's really what's happening all over the country. With the overturning of Roe v. Wade, we have seen the fight get local. So state to state, there are battles being played out all over the country. And what I'm doing right now is traveling, visiting colleges, parishes, pro-life groups, and giving them this training so that they can do the grassroots work that's needed in order to build a culture of life. So I'm gonna get into all that in just a moment, um, but I just wanna thank you so much for the warm welcome. It's great to meet so many of you, and uh, just thank you for having me to your beautiful, beautiful state and school. I'd like to begin with a word of prayer, if I could. This is a reading from the book of Jeremiah. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I dedicated you. A prophet to the nations, I appointed you. Ah, Lord God, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am too young. But the Lord answered me, do not say I am too young. To whomever I send you, you shall go. Whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them. For I am with you to deliver you, oracle of the Lord. Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for this time and this opportunity to be with these amazing students who are here to learn more about the truth of the gospel of life. I ask that you bless all our time together so that we could grow in holiness and reverence for the great gift of life and that we could be prophetic voices in our culture. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. So I love starting with that passage in Jeremiah because I think in pro-life work we hear that quoted a lot, right? Before I knew you, I formed you in your mother's womb, right? How many of you are pretty familiar with that, right? We hear that a lot, but we don't hear the verses that come after, right? That God says, I am telling you to speak, to be a prophet to the nations. And don't be worried that you're young. Don't be worried that you're uncertain. I will give you my word. I will give you my gospel of life. Just exactly what Bishop was sharing with us in his homily, right? That through our power, through the powers of the Holy Spirit in the sacraments, we have been given this prophetic gift. And so tonight I'm going to try to help you um, to really have tools and examples and um, things that you can use when you're in these conversations so that you can speak boldly on behalf of life, specifically for the unborn. So tonight is just kind of a thumbnail sketch. I'm gonna introduce these principles that we teach. We generally do half day trainings and that's what I'm gonna be doing with you tomorrow, those of you that are able to come, that are five hours long. We get really in depth with all the principles and we give you an opportunity to practice them, to have debates and to kind of see what it's like 
to learn this curriculum and then to speak from it. So if you signed up for that tomorrow, we're gonna go really in depth with that. Thank you for giving of your time tomorrow. I'm so excited, because that's when we really get to hash everything out and it's really um, a very valuable training that we do. You get a certification with it, you can put that on your resume. Healing the Culture's been around for 20 years, so that's widely recognized um, in the Catholic community and also in the pro-life community. If you didn't sign up for that but are interested in that, um, it's not too late, you can sign up. We're gonna meet starting at noon tomorrow and um, it's a whole half day training. You'll be able to get some free materials. It's completely free because we have a generous donor. So you can talk to me or maybe Father Matt if you didn't sign up but are interested in doing that tomorrow. But tonight, I'm just gonna introduce these principles. I'm gonna connect them to the life issues. I'm gonna give you some tools and examples for when you're having these conversations to make it hopefully a little bit easier. And then finally, hopefully we'll have some time for questions where you can ask uh, whatever's on your mind and we can go more in depth and see how this is relevant to your life. So again, our, um our organization was founded by a Jesuit priest, Father Robert Spitzer, who is an amazing man. Um, if any of you have seen him on EWTN, maybe some of your moms watch him on EWTN, right? He ha is just prolific. He has a PhD in philosophy of science. And he does everything from philosophy to the natural sciences and in between. And he started healing the culture over 20 years ago because he knew that Roe v. Wade wasn't really the obstacle. He knew that even if he had a magic wand, he could magically overturn it, and thanks be to God, we lived to see that happen. But he knew that wouldn't be enough, just like we're seeing now. What we really need was a conversion of the human heart. Because people were living from an impoverished worldview, right? From a low level of philosophy that said it was okay to, cert to hurt someone else as long as it got them what they wanted. So what he realized he needed to do was an educational project and to go out and to give people a better philosophy of life, a philosophy of meaning and purpose, so that they wouldn't turn to destructive things like abortion and euthanasia in order to deal with the suffering that they were experiencing. And so we teach all ages, all stages this curriculum. Again, tomorrow I'm gonna to be doing the uh, college version with those that are able to attend. So when Father Spitzer thought about how we can make philosophy accessible to people, he knew that it was a bit of a challenge, right? Because there aren't a lot of people that study philosophy with a lot of intensity. It's been removed from a lot of um, even college level curriculums. It's not a requirement as it used to be. But he realized what he could do is he could appeal to people's desire for happiness. That that was something universal and prevalent. As Pascal said, all men seek happiness. This is without exception. Whatever different means they employ, they all tend to this end. The cause of some going to war and of others avoiding it, it's the same desire in both attended with different views. The will never takes the least step but to this object. This is the motive of every action of every man, even those who hang themselves. And so upon reflecting about this universal desire for human happiness, Father Spitzer came up with kind of a colloquial version, a philosophy that would be easy for people to access in order to introduce them to these principles. And so he came up with the levels of happiness. So the levels of happiness start with the first most basic level. And so, I'm sorry, my keynote wasn't working, so this is a PDF, it doesn't have all my great animation. But um, you can see here that the levels of happiness, this first level is about physical pleasure and possessions. This level of happiness is when we get satisfaction from things we can see, touch, taste, possess, enjoy. So a ride in a fast car, or feeling the beautiful sunshine on your face, or possessing the latest form of technology, right, that makes things simple and easy. So this is the first level of happiness, and it's very important, right? We're physical beings, we need to eat, we need to sleep, we need to drink, right? It's very natural that we would pursue happiness on this level, but there's a problem. If the only thing we do is seek happiness on this level, we're gonna encounter a crisis, right? If I get satisfaction from eating a cheeseburger every day for lunch, Sooner or later, I am going to get bored of eating cheeseburgers, right? I, I was created for more, and so if I think that the sum total of my happiness is just what I can eat, I might be satisfying some physical desires, but I won't be satisfying emotional or spiritual desires. 
So this is the first level of happiness. It's very good as physical beings that we pursue these things. But we want to be aware that this isn't the sum total of happiness, that there's more to life than just physical gratification. And that brings us to level two. So this is the level of ego gratification in which we go a little bit deeper, right? It's pretty easy to take a ride in a fast car or to enjoy a, a swim at the lake on a hot summer day. It doesn't require a lot of skill or intelligence. But when we go and pursue happiness on this next level, we're activating our ego. So here we are pursuing happiness at a deeper level because we're using our intelligence, our skills, um, we're taking some time in order to pursue things that gratify our ego, that give us a sense of accomplishment, a sense of meaning, right? So you all had to apply to get into this university, right? That took some time, that took some effort. You had to take some tests, you had to get some letters of recommendation, and you got a sense of accomplishment or gratification when you were admitted to the university, right? So this level is very good and very important. Because in our society, we want people who are pursuing excellence, who are competing at the highest levels possible, who, who are achieving goals like becoming um, doctors or scientists or Olympians, right? This is a good thing to have people who compete and who try to um, endeavor to maximize their skills, their intelligence, their knowledge, right? This is a very good thing. But again, it's not where we want to stop in our pursuit of happiness. Because if we think that being the best or the smartest or the most admired or the most liked or the most followed is going to give us ultimate happiness, we're going to experience a crisis on this level too, right? Because what happens when you fail? What happens when you're not the best? What happens when someone else gets the promotion and you don't, right? We can experience feelings of anger or suspicion or uh, resentment even, or jealousy, if winning and being the best and gratifying our egos is the only thing that we dedicate ourselves in our pursuit of happiness. So we want to ask, is there a greater level of happiness that we could pursue that goes beyond the self, that might not involve these kinds of crises when we fail or don't do as well as we like? And that brings us to level three. So this is the level of altruism doing the good beyond the self, or making a contributive difference. So this is when we take our time, our talent, our intelligence, our energy, and we put it at the service of someone else. And we do good for someone else, not because it makes us look good or improves our standing or status, but because it genuinely helps someone who's in need, right? So you can think of any kind of mission trip you might go on, volunteering, helping tutor a classmate who's struggling in a class that you're taking together. Anything you can think of where you dedicate yourself to helping someone else just for their sake and not your own would qualify as this kind of happiness. And again, this is a very good thing. We really want people to be interested in the needs of others and putting their time and talents um, at the service of others, but we also have to recognize that there can be a crisis on this level too, right? And that's because we're finite creatures and there's a limit to the good that we can do. We're not going to be able to always help out when we want to. And we're going to experience sadness and disappointment if we feel like we can't do more. So that, asks, that begs the question then, can we pursue happiness at an even higher level, right? What do you think? Is it possible? Is there more happiness to be found than just doing good for others? Yeah, I agree. There is. I see some of you shaking your heads. And again, I'm going through a lot of this really fast. Tomorrow we'll go more in depth but I just want to be able to give you the framework so that you leave here this evening with a new system in mind, with a new paradigm for evaluating choices and behavior. So when we talk about our level of happiness and pursuing the good, I want to get into just a little bit what we mean by that. These are Aristotle's transcendentals, right? Hopefully you've heard of these good, or truth, love, justice, beauty, and home. What we say when we mean the good. And the thing that Aristotle and a lot of philosophers have noticed is that we as human beings, though we are finite, we have infinite desires for these things. We want these things all the time, maximally, ultimately, in a perfect form, right? We don't just want the truth some of the time from, from our friends, right? How many of you would be happy if your best friend just told you the truth half the time? 
right? That wouldn't work out. You wouldn't have a good relationship. You wouldn't have a lot of trust, right? You want the truth all of the time. Or what about love, right? How many of us desire love even when we're unlovable, right? Even when we're cranky or having a bad day or behaving badly, we still desire, we have this infinite desire for love. Something that's beyond us, something that we can't touch, but something that we know is real and that we want in our lives. Same with beauty or home, right? Home you can think of as sense of peace, belonging, maybe what we would describe as heaven. Right? We want to be known for who we really are. We want to be accepted and loved. And we have this desire in an ultimate way. But again, we can experience crisis. Right? Some of the great philosophers like Jean-Paul Sartre or others experienced great crisis when they described their desire for the transcendent, transcendent but felt like they couldn't get it in life that they would see injustice all around them, and it made them cynical. And they thought, how could there really be a God if I want something good, but I can't get it? So again, this brings us to the deeper level of happiness. Level four. So this is when we try to participate in the absolute, ultimate, and eternal transcendence. This is what religious people would call God. This is when we place our infinite desires for love and beauty and justice in him who is infinite, infinity himself, right? God. This is when we take all our desires and we attach a spiritual significance to what we're experiencing. I think a lot of time in our culture, people kind of have this schematic where they think of like God is the top of creation and then there's kind of a pyramid of, of the created world and he's sitting at the top and maybe he's interested in what's going on below or maybe he's not, we don't, we're not really sure, but God's there and we're all beneath him. But that's a real misunderstanding of who God is because God isn't just a being greater than other beings. He is being itself, love itself, justice itself, truth itself. And so happiness on this level is when we're pursuing that God, right? When we're trying to understand the truth as he really is. And on this level, just because we're pursuing God doesn't mean our life is perfect or easy, right? We can still experience crisis if we don't think God forgives us or if we don't think he loves us. If we feel unworthy or guilty before him, we can still have a hard time in our lives. It doesn't mean life is easy just because we're trying to live happiness more deeply. But this is what it looks like when we go as deep as we possibly can in our pursuit of happiness. So the way that we understand happiness is going to impact how we see things in our culture. So what I want you to try to do is I want you to try to understand these four levels as a framework for evaluating decision making. And then you can understand how things like success or love or quality of life or freedom are going to look different on each of these levels. Okay, so I'm going to show you what I mean really quick. Oh, sorry, the slide isn't on. Sorry, this is the PDF. Well, let's just take, actually, instead of success, let's just do love. So what does love look like on level one? If level one is about physical pleasure and possessions, right? Then love on level one is just about feeling good, right? It's very basic. I have love if I have physical pleasure, and that's about it. What about on level two, gratifying the ego? Well, if I'm only living from a place of ego gratification, then love on level two is just going to be about caring for somebody if they do something for me, if they improve my status, or if they make me more popular or admired. What about love on level three? Now it's going to look radically different because I'm putting the needs of someone else before myself, right? I'm seeking out someone else's benefit, not just my own. And then finally, level four. What does love look like when we attach our desires and our efforts to love himself? That's gonna be very different, isn't it? So what I want you guys to do now, I know you're probably wondering, why are we talking all this philosophy before getting to the life issues? But this is the framework, the groundwork that we're going to lay so that you can get, understand where these principles come in. So I'm sorry this slide isn't up. Like I said, this is the PDF, not the keynote that I had prepared. What I want you to do, though, is take these levels 
And with someone you're sitting next to, you can do a group of two or three, probably no more than four. I want you go, to go to the levels. Sorry. And talk about how did you pursue level one, two, three, or four today? Did you have a delicious cup of coffee? Did you help somebody out with their homework? What did you do to pursue each of these levels today? Okay? And if you can't think of anything you personally did or didn't do, you can take examples from our culture, right? When you think about um, your family, your friends, your professors, politicians, religious leaders, cultural influencers, where do you see people acting out of the most? Level one, two, three, or four? What are some examples that you can call to mind with people that you're sitting with, okay? So let's just break up for a uh, like little more than five minutes. Just get with the people next to you, have a little conversation about how you pursued one of those levels today and where you see other people pursuing those levels. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna gather us back together really quick because we only have about 34 more minutes left and I want to share with you some things that really connect to the life issues. So again, my real hope is that all of you come tomorrow because then we're going to go super in depth with this stuff. But what you hopefully can get from at least tonight is this framework for evaluating your own desire for happiness, right? And thinking about the choices you make and whether or not you're pursuing a life of meaning and purpose and dignity at the highest level possible, right? You guys are in such a beautiful and critical time in your lives as young adults in college because you are crafting, right, your future right now and you're crafting a vision for who you want to become. An essential part of that is developing your philosophy on life, right? Philosophy is just about pursuing what is good. So you're gonna have to try to understand, well, what is the good, right? And how, how do I seek that out? in my studies, in my career, in my relationships. How do I ultimatize that, right? So that, that's just laying the, the groundwork and hopefully tomorrow all of you are gonna go to class and you're gonna say that's level one, that's level two, that's level three, right? You're gonna be able to just kind of look or you're gonna look online at your phone, your social media, you're gonna see what are people's real motivations? Where are they trying to pursue happiness and gain gratification? Is it on level one and two that's gonna be fleeting? Or is it lev on level three or four that's gonna be longer lasting, right? So that's why we start with happiness because it's universal to all of us. What I'm gonna get into now are these principles of civilization. So Father Spitzer outlines 10 principles of civilization. Um, principles are just things that are basic or foundational ideas, beliefs, or claims from which other understandings spring from. A lot of these are very self-evident. Some of them are gonna be you know, just known to you because you've grown up in the United States. But we wanna understand these principles because as I was just talking about with some of the guys here, this is a great way to begin difficult conversations, right? How many of you have been in a, a debate or a conversation with someone about abortion and got really heated? Like right away. Right? And people are yelling and spitting and your heart's pounding out of your chest, right? And there's just all this frustration. So what we try to do at Healing the Culture is dial all that back down, right? And just start out with basic principles that people of goodwill and reasonable intelligence can agree on and move forward from there. So the first principle of logic, I'm gonna give you three principles of logic because logic helps us understand what's real, what's really true. The first principle of logic is the principle of non-contradiction. It comes to us from the Greeks. And this says that if a theory is valid or if an opinion is valid, it can have no contradictions. That just means if something is really true, then it can't be X and not X at the same place, in the same time, in the same respect, right? The boundaries of being exclude the boundaries of non-being. So I can't be standing here talking to you this evening and at the same time driving a car in the parking lot, right? It's not possible. That would be a contradiction to say I was doing both things at once in the same place in the same time. So the classic example, I'm sure my philosophy major will recognize this, is that you cannot have a square circle, right? Well, why is that? Why can you not have a square circle? Well, the boundaries of circle exclude the boundaries of square. So what is a circle? 
It's a round plane figure, and if you look at any of the points on it, you can see that it's all equidistant from the center point. Okay, well what is a square? A square is a figure that has uh, straight lines that form four internal right angles. So a square cannot be a circle at the same time that it's a square. Okay, you guys with me? Good. So I've had the privilege of teaching high school, and if you teach high schoolers, you get uh, someone in the back of the class that raises their hand and says, uh, Mrs. Colby, actually your principal is wrong. I can think of a square circle. And I say, wow, that's amazing. Nobody's ever done that before. And they say, yeah, I, I'm pretty smart. I can think of a square circle right now. I'm holding a contradiction. Your principal's wrong. And then I always say, well, why don't you come draw your square circle on the board? Right? At which point they're always like, well, I can't draw it, but I can think it. And I say, you are very special. Right? <laughs> and I say, but I don't know that you've really disproven my principle. I mean, what you're saying is you want to hold on to your contradiction. And that's fine. I can't force you to give up your contradiction. But if you insist that contradictions are valid, that my principle is wrong, there's no way we're going to be able to have a conversation. Because everything you say could mean something and not mean something at the same place, at the same time, in the same respect. So if you take a, a basic example of this, right, because my high schoolers are new drivers, I say imagine you're driving down the highway at 70 miles per hour and you get pulled over. Even though you've seen the, this, uh, the signpost that says that 70 is the legal limit, you get pulled over by a cop and he, he says, hey, you're, you're in trouble, you're speeding. And you say, no, I'm not, I saw that it was 70. And he says, actually, today, in this society, contradictions are valid. The speed limit's 50 and I'm giving you a ticket, right? You could see that there would be total and utter breakdown in society, there would be chaos. We couldn't have laws, we couldn't have any kind of debate or understanding, we couldn't have agreements, contracts, business, right? Everything would fall apart if contradictions were valid. Okay, so I'm gonna give you these principles and then I'm gonna connect them quickly to the life issues. So why do I bring up contradiction? Well, because we see it all the time in the pro-abortion debate. You hear people say things like, well, if you think it's a baby, then you think it's a baby and don't have an abortion. But I don't think it's a baby, so I'm gonna do whatever I want, right? You see that the, our society is trying to hold on to contradictive ideas and that our laws are enshrining this. So we can uh, grasp this with this thought experiment. Imagine there's a pregnant woman in a crosswalk and she's crossing the street in the crosswalk and she's hit by a motorist who was distracted driving and texting on his phone. In most states, the deceased woman, let's imagine that the motorist kills her and her unborn child. In most states, the deceased woman's husband could sue for damages for the wrongful deaths of two people. Almost all of our state laws say that if trauma or homicide is done to a pregnant woman, then that's a life, then that's a person, then that's a real death that we acknowledge. And that motorist could be sued. But imagine another scenario. This time there's a pregnant woman and she's crossing a crosswalk to a Planned Parenthood. And she seeks out services for an abortion. And Planned Parenthood obliges and they kill the unborn child. In the second scenario, her husband or the father of that child has no legal standing. He cannot sue, he cannot complain, he has no legal recourse. So this is an example of a contradiction in our society that's enshrined in law, in which in one case, the life of the fetus matters. And in another case, it absolutely doesn't matter just because the mother said it didn't matter. And so we have to ask that question, why would we allow this? This is completely nonsensical, and this would never take place in other areas of jurisprudence, and yet it does. So when we're having discussions around abortion, we should never listen to people, or we should never agree or go along with the idea that the fetus has subjective value because of what people say. What we should tell people is, you know what? I think that that's a human person in there, and I'm gonna try and convince you. But if you don't think it's a human person, why don't you try and convince me? And maybe if you're good at convincing me, I could be pro-abortion and on your side. Let's start out the, bait, the debate with uh, discussing our terms and coming to agreement. So that's how the first principle of logic can help us. The second principle is the principle of objective evidence. And again, this comes to us from Plato, Plato and Aristotle. And this says, for a claim to be reasonable, you must present evidence that other people, 
of reasonable intelligence and goodwill could evaluate, could validate, could replicate. Okay, this is a very important thing that gets lost in our culture where there's a lot of like news media that just talks. People get on, you know, their, their individual squares in the 24 hour news cycle and they just yell at each other, but they don't talk about actual evidence or actual facts. Thankfully, on the pro-life side, we have a lot of evidence and a lot of facts and a lot of science to back up our position, right? It's important to note, we're not pro-life people because we're so good and holy and we just feel it in our hearts, right? I think most of us are pro-life people because we've looked at this issue critically. We've examined it thoroughly and we've come to the reasonable understanding that it's a great injustice to kill someone just because they are small and weak and unborn. So the work of Dr. Jerome Lejeune really helps us here. He was a French geneticist who found the extra chromosome that causes what's known as Down syndrome. And he did a lot of incredible work um, to uh, map the human genome. He testified multiple times um, all over the world to explain what he found by sequencing the human genome. And he found that when you look at human DNA, of a zygote, so that's that initial cell that happens right after sperm egg fusion. There's one cell there, it's called the zygote. And he said, if I look at this, I can see a three amazing things. One, that that's human DNA, right? If you put it under a microscope compared to a dog or a zebra or anything else, you can quickly tell which one is human and which one is not. That's objective, that's just through our powers of perception. Right? So we say that's a human being because it's a being that had human parents. We can see from its DNA its origins. Two, he explained that it's completely unique. Right? Human DNA is so complex and so magnificent in its sequencing that it's a completely unique life. It has never existed before and it will never have the possibility to exist again. Right? This is something that really needs to be mentioned every single time that there's a debate about whether or not an unborn child should live or die. Right? What we're talking about here is eliminating a unique member of the human family. And I don't think some of the people on the other side of this issue have really considered that. Right? Who has the authority to do something like that? To say that this member of the human family doesn't belong, isn't wanted? Right? So that's how objective evidence can help us there. And then finally, he said, it's noticeable that it's alive, right? So right after sperm egg fusion, you see that single cell, and then what happens immediately? Do you guys know? Multiplication of the cells, right? Rapid, rapid multiplication of the cells. Did any of you in high school maybe watch like the PBS Nova series in science class where they do all the fetal development? Yeah, you saw that? It's awesome. If you haven't seen that, look on YouTube and you can see what it's like to watch an uh, unborn being uh, grow. In the, the whole 10 months, they do it in rapid form of gestation. It's really amazing. And Dr. Lejeune pointed out that this being is alive because we see these cells multiply rapidly, right? And it's such a fast rate of multiplication, it has to slow down later in the other months of gestation because it's so fast and it's so intense that if the human, the unborn human person continued along that rapid multiplication rate, that a baby at birth would weigh 1.5 tons, right? So in those beginning weeks of life when so many pro-abortion people want to have allowances because it's so small and it, we can't really see it, which we can, but they say things like that, right? It's, it's magnificently alive. It's observably alive. It's no less alive at the, after the moment of conception than it is at nine months of gestation, right? So that's an arbitrary thing to say that we should be able to have abortion early in the pregnancy. And objective scientific evidence can help us make that case. So at the time of Roe v. Wade, you obviously were not around back then, but a lot of people said, you know, maybe I'm gonna agree that it's a human being because obviously if you're pregnant, you have human parents. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say it's not a human person. So it doesn't really have any legal protection or moral worth. People said at the time, personhood comes later. We don't know exactly when, right? There's no like magic confetti that goes off or something and announces personhood, right? But people made the specious argument in order to justify abortion. 
And what we need to do as pro-life people is say to them, you know, I think you're making a grave mistake. Because what you're doing is you're saying some people, a whole class of human beings, are not actually people deserving of care. And people in our history have made that same argument numerous times against blacks, against Native Americans, against the disabled, against women. And the whole purpose of making that argument against that class of people is so you can disenfranchise, disenfranchise them, disempower them, keep them from voting or holding land or being free from slavery. We need to point out to people on the other side of this issue that they haven't really considered what they're doing, that they're demeaning and demoralizing an entire class of people simply for being weak, simply for being vulnerable, that it's arbitrary and wrong. And people have done that in our history, and we look back on that with such clarity, right? And we realize how grave an injustice something like slavery was, where you would take someone's race and use that as justification for subjugating them, right? It's so horribly offensive, and we see that today, clearly. But that's what we need to help people on the other side of the issue do, too. So the last principle of logic that I'm going to quickly share with you is that of complete explanation. So this says that the best explanation or theory is the one that explains the most information or the most data that we have. So how many of you guys are majors in uh, the hard sciences, natural sciences, any natural science majors? Okay, so you probably have learned about tons of examples of where we had a theory, we thought something was true, and then as we made more scientific discoveries, we realized it wasn't true, and we developed a better theory. So one obvious one is that the Earth was flat, right? People could look at the horizon, and they could see, well, it looks like a straight line. Maybe you'll fall off if you get to the edge, right? But then what happened? We started circumnavigating the globe and realizing you don't fall off. We got better at looking at the stars and understanding that the Earth was actually a sphere, Right? So we need to understand that this is an important contribution of logic, of philosophy, when we're talking about the human person. Because we're trying to explain, trying to understand for ourselves and explain to others, what is the truth about the unborn person? So we can't just look at the embryo and say we know what it is. That's what people on the other side do, right? There are some people, even scholars, who will say, well, it doesn't have arms and legs yet, it looks kind of weird, so it doesn't really need any legal protection, right? That's very limited. And even the Greeks thousands of years ago knew that you couldn't just look at something and judge it, right? And the, the philosophical example that we always use in the classroom is this little acorn, right? We can describe the acorn, we can say what it looks like, but to know what it really is, we need to talk about its powers, right? What's it capable of doing? What's an acorn capable of doing? Growing into an oak tree, right? Right? But it doesn't just do that, I mean, automatically. It needs some things in order to turn its powers on, right? It needs soil, sunlight, water, time, right? A full-grown oak is going to take 80 to 90 years, right? So we can do the same thing. We can take this same contribution from philosophy and apply it to the human person, right? That's an important thing for each of you to do, right? When you're thinking about yourself, where you're more than just your physical description, though that is important, right? What are the things you're capable of doing? Studying, sleeping, eating, making friends, right? Going to school. But what do you need in order to do all those things? You need a dorm room, you need time, you need clothing, you need shelter, you need food, you need tuition, right? All these things are essential in order for you to turn your powers on. But even when we talk about that, we still don't know what is your talos, what's your objective end? Is it just graduating? No, right? There's more to life than just graduating. Even though it's very important, it's a good thing to do. So each of you can consider, what is my objective end? Is it to become a nurse or a lawyer? To be top of my class? Is it to fall in love, to get married? Is it to answer some other vocational call? Right? Obviously, I don't know the answer for each of you. That's something you have to consider yourself. But when you start to think about that, it connects back to our levels of happiness. Because you know that your objective end isn't just about 
consuming things that give you some satisfaction, right? It's not just about like playing video games and getting ego gratification, right? It's more than that. And so what is that? If we reflect on that long enough, I think we can come to a good definition of the human person that's gonna connect back to what we're talking about in happiness. So a human person is a living being of human origin which contains all of the information necessary to guide its own development towards the actualization of its physical and transcendent nature, right? So what is it that you're gonna pursue in your studies, in your relationships, in your life that satisfies or at least uh, seeks out beauty, love, justice? What are those things? In order to understand who you truly are, you can't neglect your transcendent desires because you have a transcendent nature, right? And again, we would argue that that was purposeful, that God made you to have those desires so that you would pursue happiness to the level of seeking him out. So those are quickly three levels, or three principles, excuse me, of logic that contribute to this discussion on abortion, right? Because if we take this definition, which I think is probably the most complete definition that I've ever, co ever come across about who the human person is, we can ask, does this definition not just apply to you and me, but what about to the unborn? Even the tiny embryo has a physical and a transcendent nature that have given enough time, safety, nutrition, guidance, it's going to actualize, right? It's gonna grow and develop, if not interfered with, right? But if nurtured and cared for. So again, when we're talking about abortion, we're talking about eliminating a being of human origin that has a physical and a transcendent nature, right? And that's what's so missing from this debate because people on the other side are not acknowledging that, right? And there's good reason. It's a hard thing to acknowledge what is the reality of the human embryo, right? People on the other side are just talking about the woman and maybe her difficult circumstances, which we have to engage that. I'm not saying don't, don't address that, but we also have to not let people forget what we are discussing here, the objective nature of the, the human person. Okay, I'm gonna go through a, maybe one principle of ethics and then take your questions. So if we know what the human person is, these dual natures that it has, we can ask, how do we treat that person? In an ethical and a just society, what is a being that has physical and transcendent nature, what is it owed? What does it deserve? So how can we behave rightly or justly? So the first principle is the principle of non-maleficence, right? Male, meaning evil or harm. And this principle simply states, do no harm. Do no harm. If harm is unavoidable, then you need to minimize the harm to the best of your ability, right? And of course, you'll recognize this from um, our Catholic faith and pretty much every worldwide religion embraces this idea that you should not harm others, that you should not visit upon someone the harm that you would not want done to yourself, right? Or the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do to you. So you can see how in the abortion debate, this is a pretty basic principle. And we can, if people can't see the application of it, you can take an example that's something really basic. This is what philosophy is so good at. It can take examples and ideas that apply in one arena that are usually pretty accepted or clear to people, and then we can apply them to other issues like euthanasia or abortion. So for this principle, the hunting scenario is the most common one that we see in philosophy, where we imagine that we're all out on a hunting party Right, any, any hunters in here? Do you guys hunt in Flagstaff? In the outdoors? Nice, all right. So we've got our hunters who are leading the rest of us who don't know how to hunt, right? We're looking for a deer, we're out in the woods, but then something happens and those of us who don't know our way, we, we get lost. We're separated from the group. And so some time passes and those that have rifles are looking for a deer still and they see uh, in the distance there's a bush and there's a rustle in the bushes and they think, oh, maybe that's a deer. And then someone else in the group says, you know what, maybe that's our friends that got separated. Should you shoot? <laughs> no, right? I'm not going hunting with some of you guys. 
<laughs> right? No. No, you should not shoot. Why not? It could be a deer. Why shouldn't you shoot? It could be your friends, right? In the absence of certainty, we restrain from doing harm. And why is that? Because once done, a harm cannot be undone, right? Unfortunately, at the time of Roe v. Wade, the Supreme Court justices said, we don't really know when life begins and all of these experts are disagreeing, so we're gonna allow for a harm to be perpetrated on the unborn. That is, I'm paraphrasing obviously, but that is in the decision. That in the absence of knowledge, we're gonna pursue a path of destruction. And that path of destruction led to the death of almost 60 million American lives, just in our own country, right? That's a tragedy. That harm can never be undone. So this is the most basic and essential principle of ethics. So when you're talking to people, this is something you can start with, right? Again, don't go straight to the abortion issue because then tempers run hot and things get heated and you'll lose people before you get started, right? But you can start with something basic. Instead of trying to convert people to your position, try to clarify where they're coming from and say something like, you know, I just, I have some principles that I live my life by and I'd like to know what principles you live your life by. One principle that's really important to me is not harming anyone, avoiding harm at all costs, not hurting someone, not ending someone's life prematurely. That's just a principle that I live by. Does that seem reasonable to you? And then give it back to them, right? Because most often we are talking to people who are not bad, right? Who are not evil, they're wrong, but it's because they haven't had time, space, to really think about these issues. They haven't really formed a cohesive and meaningful philosophy of life. And you can be the person that helps nudge them in that direction, right? With grace and patience and kindness, right? Not with just a bunch of knowledge or facts or a sense of self-righteousness, right? But with a genuine desire to see their hearts opened up and conform to the truth, you can ask them probing questions and give them examples or scenarios and have them prick their moral intuition and say, yeah, I guess I wouldn't do that harm in this situation. I don't know why I'm saying it should be done in that. So I really appreciate your guys' presence here tonight. I know you're so busy as college students, but it's an absolute honor to get to meet you guys and to be with you. And we've got about uh, maybe 10 more minutes. So if there's questions, I'd love to open it up to you. Yeah, well, and, and some people, like you're gonna find, are caught in the, the question is, what do you do when you're being reasonable but other people are not being reasonable? And they won't agree on something basic, right? Like maybe do no harm. One thing is, some people are gonna be unreasonable because their ideology tells them they have to be, right? That they've made an ideological commitment and they don't wanna give that up. So there might be people that you can't really get through to. And, and that's sometimes the reality of it. And in that situation, what you need to do is just be faithful and witness. You don't need to be successful in changing people's minds all the time because what you're doing is you're planting seeds and you're giving them ideas and arguments that they've probably never heard of, right? So some people will be very stubborn about it. But on the whole, I think there's a lot more people who would like to know the truth and you can help show, show it to them. And so by being as basic and reasonable and courteous as possible, you can sometimes have very productive conversations. Yeah, does that help at all? Are you thinking of a specific example or, yeah? Did you have a question? I was say, all contradictions can be found with questions. Oh, okay, go ahead, say more about that. Um, That's a good, good one, yeah. Okay, so I'd say, I don't know, I had, I had a debate with um, like a few people about, um, you know, truth. And I asked them. Oh, sure, yeah. Sure. Take it, go for it. So I asked them, like, what, is there some like overarching truth, like as you talked about um, non-contradicting truth, and I had brought that up with them, 
And um, they said, no, I believe, you know, all truth is relative. And, um, but anyway, I went, they went on to like a new question, like what is, like, what is the difference between perception and reality? And then they had gone on to kind of explain how they believe that reality was actually that overarching truth. Hmm. And then I asked, I asked them about that. It's like, well, is reality that overarching truth? Is, um, and they'll, I don't know, they, they kept wanting to go on to, no, I, I believe there are, um, like, there's uh, relative truths along with objective truths. Hmm. And, or uh, some people will say, uh, all is objective. And I'll ask them, like, is it all, um, is that true, uh, relative? Mm -hmm. They say, um, all truth is relative. You ask them, is, is that truth a relative truth? Right. But anyway. Was, That's good. The, can, I, can I say one thing about yeah, that? Sure. That was really good. Because, yeah, it can get it to be a tangled web, right? But right. what you're confronting is what, what all of you are going to confront is that our culture is dominated by moral relativism, right? You guys know that term, right? So that truth and goodness and right behavior is relative to situations, to individuals, to feelings, to perceptions, to circumstances, right? That there's no such thing as objective truth, which we can emphatically disprove, right? Because if you're going to say that something is true for someone sometimes but not always or based on your feelings, right? Is it true for everyone that nothing is true for everyone? That's, that's the premise of moral relativism. It's true for everyone that nothing is true for everyone. That makes no sense, right? It, that, that, that whole philosophy is so bad it just implodes on itself in one line, right? But sometimes it's hard to talk to people like that because then you're getting into you know, reality and all that can be difficult. But you can just ask simple questions. Do you think there's anything that everywhere and always is wrong? And they'll be like, uh, they don't want to answer, right? And you can say, here's my example. I think it's always and everywhere wrong to enslave another person. Just because it was done up and down the centuries by basically every single society doesn't mean that it was right. It was absolutely wrong. And I would like to say that there are some things that always and everywhere are wrong. Can you think of an example? You can ask your friend, right? Can you think of an example of something that's always and everywhere wrong, right? And this is where we get into the reasonableness and their honesty. Like, if they're honest, they, they can think of something they know is always wrong. Right? Yeah, go ahead. Doing that. One more thing. Sure. Never, I uh, never um, object to like kind of a um, a general objection. Like they say, well, I don't actually believe that. It's like, okay, well, why don't you believe that? Or um, that's that's a little too general. And um, often you'll find that people, um, when you're debating with them, have rather a prejudice instead of a logical argument. Mm -hmm. So anyway. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Other questions that you have? Yeah. I don't know if this mic goes all the way, but. Um, I was going to ask, what do you do when people just like don't care? Like I've mm. talked to some of my friends and like my brother too. And a lot of times it's like, okay, like even if it is a human, like it doesn't really matter to me. Or like, I don't care. My brother even told me, he said, all the hot girls are pro-choice. So mm. <laughs> So like, yeah, what do you say this is so good. We get into so much of this tomorrow. I hope you guys all come tomorrow because these are things I talk about, uh, especially wh where it comes to men and women's roles in this discussion. That's so good. But you're, the question is, what do you do with apathy, right? Again, apathy, I think mostly I've seen it as a defense mechanism, right? I don't want to get involved because it's too much to think about or it's too sad or I don't want to say that what my friend did was wrong because I know somebody who's doing that, who has had participated in abortion some way. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Like we are living, unfortunately, you young people are living in a post-abortive culture, right? Where abortion has been part of the fabric of our society. So mostly everyone you encounter is going to have some uh, experience a relationship with it, right? So that's something to keep in mind. So, but with the apathy too, and tomorrow again, uh, we'll get into rights, right? You can sometimes talk about it just in terms of rights. Like one of my basic principles is I think all human beings have human rights. And I think they have those by virtue of their humanness. And I can't violate their rights because then if I said that it was just to violate someone's rights, then someone could violate my rights. 
So with maybe someone who's not as concerned about this issue, that's how you can approach it. You could say, well, do you care if your rights are violated? Would, would you think that it would have been justifiable for someone to terminate your life in your mother's womb? And why or why not? Oh, there's, there's people here too. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I just saw your hand going. I was just wondering the, um, the meaning of, from the definition of human person, like the meaning of the word, like information, and what mm. that encompasses. Yes, thank you. Yeah, so really, it involves genetic information, right? That we have the DNA that allows for our own human development. It's pretty amazing, right? So just allowing that person to develop and giving them the resources or the, or the excuse me, the um, circumstances necessary for the, those to activate. I'm gonna give it to you. I'll let you say good night. Do you see why we need half a day to talk about this? <laughs> Thank you, thank you, yeah. Lord, thank you for coming and Absolutely. Just, you know, like, winning our appetite and, um, and giving some great principles to, to think about, to yeah. talk about. And, and a lot of times people I know in my conversations, the, the desire against abortion is a desire, not a rational thought. It's an emotional mm -hmm. thing. But when we, when we can get through emotion, listen to the emotion, and get through to the reason, we can make a change. And that's what mm -hmm. we've found. Lord God, you who are one, you who are truth, goodness, beauty, love, life, being, we thank you for being so good to give us a share, not only in life, but in your divine life, that we might be able to be in relationship with you. Lord, it is your desire that we are here at this time, in this place, with our abilities, that maybe we, we wish we were smarter, and wiser, and all these things. And let, yeah, Lord, you know exactly our gifts. And you will give us your grace, your Holy Spirit, to speak the word at the proper time, especially to listen, to love, and to give people perhaps a space to, to ponder and talk this out. And so, Lord, we, we thank you for our mothers who've had courage to give us life, even perhaps in difficult times and circumstances. And we pray for every pregnant woman on this campus right now, that they might have the courage to choose life, and that we as a culture, as a community, might support them. We pray for a conversion of hearts throughout this campus, throughout the state, throughout this nation, and in this world. But beginning with our own, Lord, we give you permission to change our hearts, to be more converted to your truth, to your love. Mary, we ask for your intercession, especially in this important topic. We entrust ourselves to you and your care. So we pray. Hail Mary. Full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Almighty God, bless each of you who are beloved sons and daughters, and whom he is well pleased in the Father and the Son. Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You can see why I want Laura to come and talk to us, just to help us process, to kind of, how, how do you engage someone with these different questions and the thoughts that we've had? So I invite you to come tomorrow. It will be after the 11.30 mass. We'll get some food. We'll be in the back room. We'll be done by 5. Life Principles Academy. Uh, other things going on next week. You remember we had a big snowstorm and we had to postpone our marriage panel. It's back. So it's like it's one of my favorite human nights of the year. So it's kind of our last topic night before we have some fun. And so marriage panel next week. Spread the word. Uh, we are having a Greek retreat, which is a week from Friday. So if you're involved in Greek life, uh, put that on your calendar from five to nine. Welcome to the conference. It's a place for, for all students. And we do still have our Newman Scholarship applications. There's three different colored folders on the table. So if you haven't applied, someone's going to get that money. <laughs> the only community that wants to support you and your journey of faith and uh, just you know, your presence here as well. Um, 
We are grateful for Bishop Eduardo Barros to come in and bless him. He, he was at a Newman Center back in the day. Mm -hmm. so he's always been very supportive of me and his mission, always asking how it's going. And it's a thanks for being here and just hanging out. You're part of the crowd. It's great. So, yeah, so. it is. Thank you, Bishop. <laughs> uh, let's, let's thank, thank you guys very much.